In this video series, um, video three of our borrowing power series, we're going to be going through how can we adjust borrowing power to get it up if you're short for any reason. So we always start from a top-down approach. So we start with the applicants on the application and uh, just seeing if we can potentially add a second one in. You know, we've got a husband and wife, and if the husband's only listed on the application but the wife is working, um, potentially we can add her on, add her income in and increase the borrowing power. Okay, we can also do things like if a single person is listed on an application but we know that they're actually de facto um, and moving in together after a marriage, potentially uh, at the time that they find the property they want to be living together so why not add them in together as long as they you know both consent so that's that's one way we can potentially increase the borrowing power there then we look at households so how many households are there um, so you know again if you've got two single parties that have been dating um, they can't be listed as de facto because they're not living together um, but then the future purchase they'll be living together instead of having two separate households and two separate living expenses we can add that as one okay so that's one way second way is um, let's say we're looking at a, a father a mother and one child on 120 grand a year the living expenses benchmark that a bank uses might be say three thousand a month um, at a minimum so the bare minimum they're not willing to go any lower all right um, we could potentially go to another bank that has a lower living expenses benchmark of say 2600 which could increase your borrowing power there and that's only for the clients that are very frugal so if they bring up the bank statement and they don't see a whole lot there then potentially that's a way to increase the borrowing power then we start getting into the nitty-gritty a little bit so some banks have um, your main living expenses which is about 80 to 90 percent of them um, and then they've got this small section at the bottom for um, you know, non-standard stuff like um, second property, body corp, strata, um, things like that, uh, private schools, things like that. So potentially um, you're not just getting the, the living expenses benchmark for the main portion, you're getting double hit for double disclosing the income on the second portion. Okay, so again, just reviewing that, making sure you're in the right categories with the right bank could potentially increase your borrowing power. Okay, then we start looking at, you know, what you've disclosed. So we've looked at the bottom end of the spectrum, but I have met a, a number of clients that over disclosed their living expenses. And then I looked at the bank statement and it was just nowhere close to that. And I understand some clients are very conservative, but they need to understand the, um, I had a client in Melbourne that uh, over disclosed by $1,600 a month. Um, and then they, f they fought me a little bit at the start and wanted me to enter it. But then um, it ended up creating a problem on the application because it was such a tight application. Um, so then, you know, I had to get down to the nitty gritty, tell the client the impact that this has had, and then um, go on to the assessor, said, you know, exactly what had happened, and please go off the bank statements, which are obviously showing much lower, um, which ended up solving the issue that we were in. Okay, so that's that's another one. Then we look at income. So um, are you full-time? Are you part-time? Are you casual as a PAYG worker? Or are you a contractor on PAYG rolling contracts? Or are you self-employed? So sole trader or company? Okay, and the whole point is we need to maximize the income being used. So if you're a PAYG worker, um, what base wage are we using? And then how do we maximize you know, anything else that you've got. So your overtime, your allowances, your commissions, your bonus. Okay, um, potentially there are other banks out there that use larger portions of, of secondary income, which is great. Um, and there are other banks, if you're, you know, a PAYG contractor or casual, um, that um, allow you to annualize the income over six months instead of 12 months. So again, that could have a very large impact on your borrowing power. Okay, and then in the self-employed space, um, to, if you're sole trader, it's very simple. We go off your last two years tax returns. And if there's a big gap in the income, we've got to be very selective on the bank that we're going with. So um, 
in, in regards to that, we're looking at um, if there's a big gap, there's only really three banks in, on the market that will go off the most recent high year's income. So if you're at 150 for your last tax return and 80 for the prior one, um, there's only really three banks in the market that will take the most recent income if there's a really big gap in the income. So that alone, if you haven't selected those three banks, um, you're in a situation where um, you're shaving half of your borrowing power, it's gone. Okay, then you've got um, other banks that will use, um, if there's a 20% gap in the income, they'll go off the average of the two years. And then if there's a massive gap, so 20 to 30% drop or increase in the income, then um, they'll go off the lower figure. And then um, there's just some banks that just don't like self-employed at all. Okay, and then if you go into the company space, it's very much the same. So we look at your net profit, we look at your salary and wages, um, but then potentially we could look at ad backs. So do you have any depreciation on there? Do you have any interest expense? Do you have any bad debt write-off? Um, so there's some banks that it's called an ad back. So they'll actually add income back into your application because you did derive a benefit from that um, that line item. Um, so they'll add that income back into your application and boost your borrowing power. Okay, so we're not going to go too specific, but that's something that can happen. Then we go and have a look at your liabilities. Okay, so um, we're looking at your current liabilities. So personal loans, car loans, credit cards, uh, student hex debt, zip pay, after pay, or a current mortgage. Okay, so um, if you've got 50 grand worth of credit card limits, not many people know, even if all of them are paid off, um, how a bank calculates it, or most banks, they do 3.5% of your total loan limit, and then they add that as a monthly expense, even if you're not using it. So why not reduce your credit cards, or close your credit cards, and increase your borrowing power? So if you've got 50 grand worth of credit cards, that could be impacting your borrowing power by up to you know, 100 to 150 grand at a bare minimum. Okay, are there any line items that we can pay off or close down? So personal loans, car loans, everyone does the zip pays and after pays for your, um, for your Christmas period. So have you used it? Can we close it down? Um, most of the time the limits on those are only one to two thousand um, dollars. And then we've got to look at um, potentially, you know, anything else like a hex debt. Okay, so hex debt you know, have you lodged your tax return? How much is left? So if you've got an extra, if you've got between five to 10, uh, to 10 to 15 grand left, and we know that you haven't lodged your tax return, but when you do, that line item's gonna come down a lot and potentially go away, then why not wait a month? Okay, lodge the tax return, reduce the hex debt, get your MyGov screenshot, show it, and then we don't have to list it as a line item and increase your borrowing power that way. So that's another way of doing it. Okay, um, then we look at your mortgage. Um, if you've got any current mortgages, okay, how many years left on the mortgage? Can we potentially bump it back out to 30 years if it's an investment loan to increase the borrowing power? Are you interest only? Are you, do you still want to structure it like that or do you want to reduce the rate? and then um, switch it to principal and interest, which again, uh, you get a two, two um, times effect. Uh, by switching it from interest only to principal and interest, you'll get a bump in your borrowing power. Um, the main reason is, let's say you're on a five year interest only term, and you're, you're um, on a 30 year mortgage, uh, you're actually squeezing the principal and interest repayments into a very small window of 25 years, which reduces your borrowing power. So if you switch it back to principal and interest, um, you're actually increasing your borrowing power. What you're also doing is getting a better rate on principal and interest repayments. So again, you're increasing your borrowing power. Okay, so um, so those kind of items are helpful. Then we look at the, the rental that you're getting. So um, what negative gearing benefits will, is that bank giving you on the interest expense that you're getting on any investment loans? Are we with the right bank there? How much of the uh, rental is that bank using? Some banks only use 60, 70, 80%. Some banks cap the rental yield at 6% max. 
Um, and if you've got a rental appraisal that's high, they'll go off the valuation, okay? They, whatever the valuer says on the, um, on the rental, okay? They won't go off a rental appraisal that shows much higher. So again, we can go with banks that are, are much better and use 80 or 100% of the rental and uh, much uh, better on the, the types of rental uh, they'll use and are they willing to use the, the rental appraisal or, or the valuation and what's shown on the valuation report for rental. Okay, then we look at your current mortgage. How is it being structured? Very similar to the current liabilities mortgages. So uh, is there any room for that? Are we on a better rate at the moment? Uh, what is the assessment rate on top of that? So the, the rate the bank stress tests you at. Uh, what interest rate have you got that's ongoing? Is it an intro rate product that bumps up after two years? Um, I'll give an example, um, the Westpac Group. Um, if you take a two-year fix, let's say three months ago, you could have gotten a 1.89%. Okay, um, some banks, um, what, the Westpac Group especially, they won't go off that rate. They'll go off the roll-off rate after two years. So it could be, you know, your variable rate of 2.55%. All right, so um, that decreases your borrowing power. So when I tell a client this, they may very well want to settle on a, a much lower variable rate of say 2.2 or 2.3% and then settle the deal two, three months later and then figure out if they want to fix after that. So then they don't have the borrowing power hit um, taken off them when they're doing the application. So simple things that you need to understand with banks can have great impacts on your borrowing power. So this video is only, um, is, it's not financial advice, I don't know your personal circumstances, but this is just lists of things that I can look at. I mean, we're not even talking about very specific product and features that we could use in the mid-tier banks that um, you can't get with the major banks. All right, so hopefully this um, video has given you a lot of value and we'll see you on the next one. All right, bye.